Lord, we thank you again for this day and just for your many blessings. And now uh, speak to our hearts, Father, as we open up your word. We look at the prophet Haggai again and uh, talking about uh, trusting you when um, it seems like that uh, what you've promised has taken a while to get to us, Lord. And so teach us from your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you would, the lights are about to come on, so if you want to turn around in your chairs, uh, we can all make noise and be blinded at the same time. Um, and uh, open your Bibles to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. Can God be trusted to keep his word? <clears throat> now, obviously, you know if you're in church, the answer is going to be yes, right? But uh, the idea of the message or where we're headed is kind of living in between the promises that God has given you or you think that God has spoken to your heart and he's promised you something and the time between when you feel like God has promised you something and when he delivers on that promise is a long time and you're kind of caught between knowing God's promise and then receiving that promise and uh, so can he be trusted really when we're in that moment of delay uh, Really, some of this is kind of interesting because we've been in Haggai for a few weeks and uh, we'll have, you know, next week we'll conclude with this um, uh, prophecy or with this particular uh, uh, book of the Bible. And um, last week, uh, Pastor Luis preached a sermon and if you weren't here, I hope you watched it online because it was uh, uh, something I needed to hear and I think some, of you, some other ones were like that as well. But Pastor Luis talked about the promises of God as well. And uh, kind of the same idea of um, uh, caught between God's promise and his fulfillment. And he used the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and the birth of John the Baptist uh, of how uh, Zechariah had been praying and Elizabeth had been praying for a child for so long they quit praying and had forgotten what they were asking God for. And then after a while God comes and answers their prayer. They don't believe he's answered their prayer. Right? They don't believe he's going to do what he said he would do or what they've been praying about. And so that was kind of the same idea of this delayed answer. And so if you've prayed about something and maybe you've heard in your spirit that God is, is going to deliver you from something or, or maybe you see a promise in his word and, but you think and you look around and you say, I don't see this fulfillment in my life even though I know God has promised that. What do you do with that? What do you do if you've been waiting for days or months or even years before you see that promised blessing come into your life. When you are in the middle of the promise and the fulfillment, can God be trusted to keep his word? Because let's be honest, sometimes I think we doubt that. We start to doubt because God, when are you going to do what you said you were going to do? And doubt starts to creep in. If so, if God can be trusted, how do we know for certain that he can be trusted? Well, again, we're in church, so you know the answer is yes, he's going to be trusted. But how can we know for sure? Well, here in Haggai's third sermon to the Hebrew remnant that had returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, I think Haggai gives us a little bit of insight into this, or at least God's word through the prophet Haggai. And so let's put this in context just a little bit before we look at, at today's scripture. As way of reminder, remember that after 59 years of being in exile, a remnant of the Jews in, Babyl in Babylonian returned to Jerusalem, and the distance would have been 900 miles from Jerusalem to Babylon, or Babylon to Jerusalem, basically Baghdad uh, to Israel, a distance of 900 miles. They'd been in exile for 59 years, but now a remnant of them returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. The temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians. Now, the temple is important in the Hebrew faith because it represented the presence of God. The New Testament now tells us that our bodies are the temple of God, and so now God resides in us. But in Israel's day, or these ancient days, that temple represented the very presence of God. And so Cyrus, the Persian king, had now defeated the Babylonians, and as a result of his defeat of the Babylonians, he allowed the Hebrews to return home, and he even offered to use government funds to help rebuild the temple, but because of hardships and threats from the Samaritans, 
that remnant who returned to rebuild the temple had quit. And instead, they started concentrating on building their own homes. And so their priorities had changed. They'd made a commitment that they were going to rebuild the temple. They probably even thought that God had promised them that they were going to rebuild the temple. And so they go back and they start to rebuild, but things got tough. And so they quit. They lost focus. They lost direction. They had forgotten why they even started for. And now God saw their quitting as an act of disobedience. And so Haggai, an aging prophet, probably in his 70s at this time, a prophet who remembered the grandeur of Solomon's temple. He was probably a prophet in Jerusalem 60 years before the, you know, and, and so he was one of the ones who were exiled to Babylonia, and now he had gone back to Jerusalem. So he remembered the grandeur of Solomon's temple, and so now he writes four oracles or prophecies or sermons in these two chapters to encourage the people to finish rebuilding the temple. And so look at chapter 2, verse 10. In chapter 2, verse 10, Haggai introduces his third sermon. He says, On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. I think that's how, starting next week, that's how I'm going to start introducing my sermons. On the 17th day of the ninth month in the first year of Donald Trump, the word of the Lord came to me and said. (laughs) This particular sermon was two months after the previous sermon. If you go back into uh, Haggai chapter 2 verse 1, he says the same thing, but he gives it a different date. And so that was sermon number 2. And now about two months had passed, and so now he's preaching his third sermon. So that means that the date for this particular sermon, sermon number three, was December the 18th, 580 B.C. So 520 B.C., 520 years before Christ uh, was born in Bethlehem. December. Now, that date is important to the story, as we'll see as we go along, because December, even over there, is still the winter. This is in the middle of winter, and you don't expect to have large crops during the winter. So keep that in mind. Now, the occasion for this third sermon was some type of dedication service for the completion of the foundation of the temple they had been building. And so you read in in Haggai chapter 2, verse 18, from this day on, from the 24th day of the ninth month, Give careful thought to the day when the foundations of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. And so at this dedication of the foundation of the temple, Haggai delivers this sermon. And his sermon begins with two questions to the priest. Two questions that had two obvious answers. So look at Haggai chapter 2, verse 11. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priest what the law says. If a person carries consecrated meat in the fold of his garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? And the priest answered, no, according to the Mosaic law. No. Then Haggai said, here's the second question. If a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied. It becomes defiled. So let's look at that just a little bit closer. What were these questions? Well, let me kind of summarize the questions or restate the questions like this. Here is what Haggai was saying. Question number one, if something has been made holy, that's the idea of consecration. And so Haggai says, "If, if a piece of meat has been consecrated, it's been prayed over, it's been made holy. If that piece of meat touches something else, does that something else become holy because the meat was holy? 
And so question number one is, if something has been made holy, does it make something else holy just by touching it? And the obvious answer was no. Just because something is holy doesn't mean if it touches something else, it makes that something else holy. And so then he asked the second question. If something is unholy, does it make something else unholy just by touching it? And so in the, in the Old Testament, a dead body would be considered unholy. And so if, if that if, if somebody touched something that was dead and unholy and then they touched the meat that had been made holy, does the meat become unholy because the person had touched something that was dead and then touched the meat? And so if something is unholy, does it make something else unholy when it touches it? And of course, according to the Mosaic law, the priest knew the answer was an obvious yes. You say, now Kevin, what is the point of this? Well, follow along. Here's the first lesson from this sermon. Holiness is not contagious, but unholiness is. Now think about that. In other words, a person can be found guilty by association, but a person cannot be found innocent by association. Or, to put it another way, there's an old saying that I remember years ago as a kid, and I think it was somebody in church camp who said it when I was in elementary school, and I've never forgotten it. So here's an old saying, at least it's old to me, it may be the first time you've heard, but it goes like this, no matter how many times you throw a clean sheet into a mud puddle, the mud puddle never becomes clean, right? Never. And here's another old saying, and maybe you've heard this one. Bad company corrupts good character. Right? And so here is what Haggai, or the God is saying through Haggai, look, you, you can't just think that you're going to be made holy because somebody else who is holy touches you. It doesn't work like that. You can, be, you can be found guilty of something, or if you're hanging around the wrong person, or if you're in the wrong place, you can become contaminated by something that is contaminated, but you can't become holy just because you're around something that's holy. It doesn't work that way. Now, what was God saying to the Hebrews through this? Well, look at verse 14. Then Haggai said, So it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer, offer there is defiled. What God was saying was that by neglecting their work, even before their captivity, all of their worship and gifts and prayers have been unacceptable to God. Thus, they were now suffering because of their own sins. Here's the application. Here's what God is saying to us today. You can't live like the devil during the week and expect God to be pleased with your worship and offerings on Sunday. You can't do that. To put it another way, Sundays do not sanitize the rest of your week. The rest of your week defiles what you do on Sunday. Does that make sense? Holiness is not contagious. But unholiness is. Now, let's back up just a little bit. God had promised his blessings if the people would rebuild the temple. Now, the people had suffered through hardships. Look at Haggai chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, just to remind us. The, um, God says to the prophet in Haggai chapter 1, verse 10, Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. God says, because of your disobedience, you are in a drought. Verse 11, I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces on men and cattle and on the labor of their hands. 
And so God had promised them a blessing, but the people were going through hardship. Now God promises to fill the temple with his glory. He says, I have caused this drought to come, but if you will just build the temple, look what happens in chapter 2, verse 7. God says, I will shake all the nations and desired of all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace. So God says, you're going through your hardships because of your disobedience. Do what I say and I will open up the floodgates of heaven. And so the people started building. They had been building for about three months. They'd gotten the foundation laid. The people stopped everything to rebuild the temple. And for three months, that's a long time, isn't it? I've been waiting for stuff a whole lot longer than that. For three months, they had been working And yet, God had not delivered his promise. God was not blessing them. In fact, their hardships continued. Now, have you ever been here? Where God says, look, you know your life is messed up because of how you've been living it. You need to repent and turn to me. And if you return to me, I'm going to bless you. And so you repent and you return to God and and you start following God. And three months down the road, you look and think, things have gotten worse. Not better. Right? Look what happened. Chapter 2, verse 15. God says, now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were done before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there was only 10. So they were, their crop was only half what they thought it should be. Now, but remember, why are they even thinking they're going to get a bumper crop? It's December. <laughs> right? And they're upset because their crops aren't growing like they think they should. And it's the middle of the winter. And they're like, when anyone comes to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there was only 20. That's less than half. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail. Yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. God was slow in keeping his promise. The people were saying, God, I'm doing everything you ask me to do, but I have nothing to show for it. You ever been there? And you started to wonder, God, can you be trusted? I mean, Lord, it's been a whole three months. I've lived 40 some odd years without you and I'm three months. Nothing. Can God be trusted? So here's the second lesson that I think Haggai is teaching us. Before receiving blessings, we must first remember that the mess we are in is often our own fault. God was just trying to remind them. You're expecting something to happen, but you've got to admit, you've got to realize, you've got to confess that the reason you're in the mess that you're in is because of your own decisions. It had only been a few months since God had made this promise to his people, and they were already getting on the verge of quitting again. How often do we spend years in disobedience and then expect God to change everything overnight? And if he doesn't, we quit. We need to confess that as bad as things may be, 
if God treated us the way we really deserve to be treated, it would be far worse. Can you admit that? Lord, I, I was living this way and I know it was wrong and, and I've, I've admitted that and I've confessed it and now I've been following you for three months and I don't see a difference. And God said, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That whole time you were living far from me, did I judge you? Did I condemn you? Did I do anything to you? No, I treated you with grace during that whole time. If I would have treated you like you deserved, you would have never been here. Here's how Jeremiah says it. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We need to be on our hands and knees every day and saying, God, things may be tough. I may not understand what in the world is going on. I may wish that things were different. But thank you, Lord, for not treating me the way I deserve. Thank you for showing me compassion every day. You know, if we went around, you don't have to do this, but if we went around and we, and we were honest with each other, there would be a lot of us in this room who could testify, you know what, I should have been dead then. I should have been dead then. I should have been dead over here. But God has spared me. Even when I was far from him, he showed me grace. So who am I to be complaining because God hadn't answered my prayer like that? Let me see. God's grace is greater than our sins. And so before you start complaining that God has not answered your prayers and fulfilled his promises when you think he should, remember your own failures and give thanks for his abounding grace. And then a third lesson. God's blessings Follow our obedience and his blessings always come at just the right time. Look at verse 18. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, so from December 24th, 520, from this day on, give careful thought to the day when the foundations of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not become, have not borne fruit up till now. But from this day on, I will bless you. From this day on. Here's what God is saying. It's December 24th. It's the middle of winter. Is this the time that you normally harvest your crops? Of course not. Why are you so upset? Why are you wanting a miracle? I will keep my promise. I will meet your need. But I will do it in the ordinary course of time. I will provide for you in the normal way. Just wait a few more months. Now, we are more like this than we think. We get ourselves in a mess by our own disobedience. And then we expect God to, or to miraculously deliver us from our mess on our time schedule. Because of our own sin, something bad has happened. And then we get mad at God and ask him, why did you allow this to happen? Lesson number four. Don't expect God to do the miraculous when he can just as well provide through the natural. Now, this is the opposite of health and wealth. 
you know, do this and God's going to miraculously do something. What God is saying, no, 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 look, just trust me. I, I don't need to do a miracle to meet your need here. You just do it through the natural course of things. Here's some applications. Please don't get too mad at me. But here's some applications. You got yourself in debt because of bad decisions or greed or envy or whatever. Don't expect God to miraculously cause money to fall from heaven or through the lottery. Just work hard, pay your debts, and pray for God to give you the strength to get out of the mess that you created for yourself. And from this day forward, God will help you with that. Your health is bad because you're overweight. <laughs> oh no. You following me? Look, I'm picking on myself here. All right. Your health is bad because you're overweight. You're overweight because you eat too much. <laughs> Don't expect God to give you a magic diet pill. Exercise, eat right, follow your doctor's orders, and watch what he does through the natural course of things. Does that make sense? But we get ourselves in a mess and say, God, miraculously deliver me now. And God's like, why? One more. You did not study for that test tomorrow at school or at work because you binge watch something on Netflix. Don't expect God to give you divine interventions to the answers that you just don't have. You say, Kevin, you're being too harsh. You're being too harsh. Where's the hope? Well, lesson number five. God does not promise miracles. However, he does promise grace. And you can count on grace every day of your life. God said through the prophet in verse 19, from this day on, I will bless you. The people had, had done nothing to deserve that promise. And that's the whole point of Haggai's sermon. I don't care if you have been building for three months. You haven't done anything to deserve God's grace in your life. But because I love you from this day forward. I will bless you. That's grace. And grace is far greater and more miraculous than miracles. You see, there are lessons that we have got to learn by going through the cleanup of our mess. And God gives us the grace to do that. It's called tough love. But when God's involved, not only is it tough love, it's unconditional love. There's an old story of a father who took his young son out one day and stood him on the railing on the back porch. And then the father went down and stood on the lawn and encouraged the little fellow to jump into his arms. I'll catch you, the father said confidently. Just trust me, just jump and I will catch you. After a lot of, co uh, after a lot of encouragement, the little boy finally made the leap. And when he did, the father stepped back and let the child hit the ground. <laughs> you didn't know I was going there, did you? He then picked up his son, dusted him off, and dried his tears, and said, let that be a lesson to you. Don't ever trust anyone. Now, it's that type of cynicism that makes it difficult for us to trust God. Is it not? We've been taught our whole lives, don't trust anybody but yourself. 
Don't trust anybody but yourself. Ain't nobody else going to do it for you. You got to do it for yourself. That's what we've been taught. And as a result, we find it difficult to trust God, especially when it seems that his promises are delayed or they're a long time in coming. So can God be trusted even when his promised blessings seem to be delayed? Absolutely. Positively. Without a doubt. He can still be trusted. On your table is a piece of paper that's got a poem on it. And I want to close with this poem. If you don't have it, you can, if you've got really good eyes, you can see it. But <clears throat> on the table, here's this poem. And it's entitled, Trust in God. And <laughs> this is so true. I asked for strength and God gave me difficulties to make me strong. I asked for wisdom and God gave me problems to solve. I asked for prosperity and God gave me brain and brawn to work. I asked for courage and God gave me danger to overcome. I asked for love and God gave me troubled people to help. I asked for favors and God gave me opportunities. I received nothing I wanted. I received everything I needed. Trust in God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, again, we thank you for this day. And Lord, I know at least on one level, these words from Haggai are not um, very encouraging. Through the prophet, you are trying to get people to see, look, Admit that a lot of the mess you're in is your own fault. Admit that. And then I can bless you. But yet, Lord, at the end, it is encouraging because it was like from this day forward, I will bless you. And so, Lord, I pray that even today, right now, we are confessing our sins. We are looking to you and saying, Lord, I'm so sorry for asking you to do things that maybe I shouldn't have asked because it was my own Mess And what you're saying to our lives is consider this. Consider this. On September 17th, 2017, the foundation has been laid. And from this day forward, I will bless you. So, Lord, help us every day of our life to see your blessings that come through the natural course of events. To be able to say that prayer that so many of the older generations say of, of reminding us that God woke me up this morning. Simple blessing. The food that we have. The jobs that we have. The clothes that we have. And Lord, even those of us who may not have hardly anything, you are still there in our lives and you're working with us and you're loving us and you're getting our attention. We have so much to be thankful for. From this day forward, Lord, may we follow you, looking for you to meet our needs through the natural or through the miraculous, however you decide is best for us. And we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand and let's say our prayer together. Say this with me as we leave. As we leave this place of worship and fellowship, let us commit ourselves to love and serve God by loving and serving our neighbors. You're dismissed. Yeah.